time for the visit with the person of high strangeness. Um, I'm going to tell you a little story today. A, a few months ago, we buried my friend um, Keith Eubanks, and uh, uh, I was asked to do his uh, opening eulogy there, or whatever you want to call it. And um, I guess the friends um, had went to the church, and a preacher had to go with that, and then the preacher had the opening and the closing remarks. And we had a wonderful um, service for him. And at the end, the preacher summarized it, and he said, uh, uh, now, not one person has mentioned anything about being, uh, about this person being at peace with the Creator, or the person that um, was responsible for all of this, or liable for all of this. And uh, we just heard um, all the small talk, how wonderful he was, and things like that. And then he looked around the audience, and he said, and look at you, you all look like peacocks. He said, all dressed up, you beautiful peacocks. And then he looked right at me and he said, but look at your feet. You have ugly feet. And uh, what does a peacock have to do with today's shows? Well, um, I tell you. Uh, if you remember, we did the Oklahoma cover-up. And at that time, I, I told you we was going to take it a step further and carry, um, carry you to the anti-terrorism bill and show you how it affects every person. Um, in America these days. And so in some essence, uh, the bill is a peacock. It's beautiful until you look at the feet. And I couldn't think of a better person or friend to come and help um, us kick that around and make it simple for you, because these are legal terms, uh, mm -hmm. than our friend Tom Stahl. So he came back and uh, from east of the mountain. Hi, Tom. How are you? Yes. Hi there. Yes, I am. Got back from central Washington. Mm -hmm. I drove over last night. Actually, yesterday I was still finishing up working on one of my fields. Mm -hmm. And then I had to move some machinery. And then I came back to the house and I thought, oh, I can't leave it in such a mess. I need to take out trash, sort it to, I have various recycle bins, so it's not just taking it out and dumping it. You got to take it out and sort and put in all these different barrels. Being a good citizen. Yeah, uh, that's are. me. A good <laughs> yeah. citizen, um, at least in that respect. In other mm -hmm. respects, well, who knows? We'll, after this show's over with, we'll <laughs> we don't ask know. the authorities whether he's a good citizen. <laughs> I'm just going to be using their own materials, though. Yeah. And then I had to wash the dishes. So after all that, then I sat down and rested, and then, uh-oh, I'm late to get on the road. But I did make it, mm -hmm. uh, and here I am today. And here you are today, yeah. And um, it, it's, I'm always uh, real grateful when you come so long, but one of, one of the things is that the friends like so much is because like I said, even though those are legal terms, we, you have a way of speaking English, and they really appreciate that. So Tom Stahl is a household word, you know. <laughs> well, at least they're just one syllable, you know, a couple one syllables there. That's you know. right. Because yeah, uh, I think what Tom's making reference to, I just mutilate everybody's name, but yours is always. You get it right every time. Every time. Yeah. <laughs> every you have time. a certain rhyme, Tom, or a certain <laughs> assonance there. Tom and then Stahl, the two vowels are the same. Yeah. You know, even though the spell different. <laughs> okay. Well, let, let's go back for just a minute in time here um, to refresh the friends' minds that um, we were, and uh, I'm going to add some here, we had aired the um, Oklahoma cover-up um, uh, stories for you. And it was a two-parter, and at, like I said, at that time, we had promised to do what we do now. But you were also brave enough to, to air that same show in Ellensburg, did you not? Yes, we did. I had some help. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple local uh, Libertarian Party activists, uh, Brian and Jacqueline Bartels, mm -hmm. their uh, husband and wife, they said that they would rent the hall, mm -hmm. and they did, the Hell Home Center. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think of the date. I believe it was um, June It was on 8th. a Thursday. We added on, on the Thursday. same night. Mm -hmm. It was either June 8th or 9th. It was on a Thursday. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they advertised and we had uh, several people come, mm -hmm. and then we had copies of the tape available mm -hmm. for people if they wanted th yeah. the tape itself. Mm -hmm. So they could both see it there, and it was just had a TV, cam yeah. uh, TV set up with a mm -hmm. video cassette recorder, and then they could uh, buy the tape. They were only, the tapes were only $10. Mm -hmm. So the very same tape that aired on your show mm -hmm. was also aired in, in Ellensburg. That took a lot of guts and and thank you for doing that. You know, um, I was wondering if it would at the time, and it really didn't seem to take that much, because I just stood up and told what I had seen personally, 
when I went I'm there. That's going with that. Thank you. And uh, I had some help because Pat Michael, mm -hmm. if people remember Pat Michael from an yes, earlier show, she days. was there too. And she mm -hmm. stood up and told what she had seen. And then there were other people who had heard pieces of the puzzle right. here and there. Mm -hmm. And they added to it. So it was... Instead of me, you know, standing up and telling the story that nobody had heard before or would agree with, and I'm just the uh, oddball out, yeah. why everybody's saying, yes, that makes a lot more sense than what we're hearing yeah. on the news media. Um, if I may, I'll go into what I saw in, uh, in early December of year please. 2000. Yeah, when, when you went. Uh, Pat Michael and I had gone to see her mother in Missouri, and it was a driving trip. Mm -hmm. And it was on our way back, we are going to take a different route back, and we took the southern uh, freeway, and I believe it's I-70, I may have the number wrong on that. Anyway, we're taking the freeway from, uh, from Missouri, we drove on country roads down through Arkansas, very beautiful by the way, and then uh, wild kind of country, and then get on the freeway and go into Oklahoma. We're driving along, it's still daylight, although daylight is leaving us, and Pat says to me, how close is this freeway going to go to Oklahoma City? I says, well, it's going to go right by, right by the city. She says, uh, let's turn off and go into Oklahoma City and see that bombing site, the Alfred P. Murrah bombing site where the building was bombed in 1995. I says, oh, there won't be anything there. It's been, you know, five years ago. She says, don't count on it. There'll be a lot there to see. Yeah. I says, well, I don't even know if we can find it easily. She says, let's just take a chance. So we take an exit, says city center, and easy to find, that's, she was on the right track. There are signs directing you, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Oklahoma bombing site. And you go right that's into the downtown area, and there's about three acres now, downtown yeah. devoted to it. They've it's even a taken, monument. Yes, it's a monument. Yeah. They've even taken Real other money buildings. money maker. <laughs> I, I think it, it may, but it's, it's got something more important than money. It has a very powerful emotional and mental impact when you go there. The grounds are large. You get to see the size of the building, which mm -hmm. you wouldn't necessarily from just photographs or TV. There is another building in the area that is of the same type of architecture, just a couple blocks away, and you can see that. Mm -hmm. A very large, rectangular, cement, uh, high-rise, kind of a rectangular, very solid building. There's even a corner, and I believe it is the south uh, east corner of the building, a piece, has been left standing. So you can see the thickness of the walls. I don't know, I'll hold out for the camera. Like this, you know, two feet, more than two feet, cement. And in the cement, you, there are pieces of rebar. Rebar is steel reinforcing bar. And it is laced with steel reinforcing bar. This is just the wall, not the support columns. Okay. So when you see that, you get an idea of what kind of a blast would it take to blast through that first yeah. and then shear off support columns. And I'm trying to think, I believe there were seven support columns sheared off. And one deep in the building, the B3 uh, or four column deep in the building sheared off. Everybody remembers the photographs with the, the hook deep in the building. And so a fertilizer truck parked outside. And when I say outside, I'll... Uh, I'll borrow on, on something that uh, an eyewitness saw years before. I know a woman named Kay Powers from Ellensburg. And she was in that building before it was blown up mm -hmm. a long time ago. And she said there was a, uh, on the north side of the building where the parking lot was and where the truck supposedly was parked, she says, you can't park right next to the building. Yeah. There's a, a little lawn area that comes down. You're away from the building, see. So you're parked you know, what, 20, 30, 40 feet away from the building. So this blast has to come through the air and then go through this wall and then shear off support columns deep inside the building. Uh, so we got to see the scene and the size of it and the thickness of the walls. Something else very interesting. There is a tree in what was the parking lot. Now they've turned it into grounds, walking grounds. It's no longer a parking lot. There's a tree in that parking lot on that north side near where the truck was parked, where the truck was supposedly parked. It's called the survivor tree. Mm -hmm. There's even a plaque to it. It's, it's an elm tree. We go up to the tree and look at it. Look all around it. Walk all around it. It's still symmetrical. Mm -hmm. There's no damage to that tree that I could see. 
no missing branches or limbs, no missing. scarring. It is still very symmetrical. And what's amazing is the tree stands and the building blows down. Mm -hmm. Now that is a physical impossibility. Another very strange thing, and you can see it very clearly when you're there. Beyond the tree is the old journal record building. The journal record building is a brick building built somewhere like around the turn of the last century, like early 1900s. It is not nearly the strong construction of the cement steel rebar reinforced building that the Alfred P. Murrah building was. And the journal record building still stands. Still stands, yeah. There's plaques on these, and you can yeah. read what the plaques say. And they say, well, a few windows were broken. A few ceiling tiles fell in the journal record building. No structural damage. Yeah. The very powerful building built to withstand earthquakes, the federal building, blows down. Well, what is, what is the conclusion? Well, I won't uh, say it just out of my own mouth. I will let a couple other people who were there. There were three young women there, college-age girls, and they were also looking at the survivor tree. And Pat, Michael, and I were looking at it. So I turned to them, and I said, do you believe that a fertilizer truck, a fertilizer truck bomb parked outside, blew that mirror building down and left this tree standing? And one girl says, no, I don't believe that at all. I believe there were bombs inside the building. Mm -hmm. And the other, and the second girl says, yes, that's what I heard too. Mm -hmm. I says, well, where are you folks from? They said, well, they were from Florida. Mm -hmm. They didn't ask any more questions than that. But I, I'll, I'll stop here because you may want to have questions or comments. I've rolled on well, quite a ways okay here. Well, that's okay because I'm going to blow you right into the... Um uh, Anti-terrorism bill, because that's what today's show's all about. Yes. Okay. Uh, before I go to that, I want to say one more You're thing. You're going to blow back this way. Yeah, no. I'll go back <laughs> this way. Just one more thing. I have at this point now talked to three people who have had experience, personal first-hand experience with explosives and or construction. And every one of them says that this idea of a fertilizer truck bomb parked outside away from the building, shearing off those columns inside, that that is a, and I'll put it bluntly, a crock. Mm -hmm. The first man is Leroy Livermore of Global Pacific Lumber. And he called me on the telephone some years ago after the bombing, say, somewhere in 1996. And it was because he, he wanted to log some land that my mom, a small amount of land that my mom has north of Lake Chelan. And I said, no way at all. This land is too steep. It would be ecologically uh, unsound, unsound, bad yeah. decision to do. That land needs those trees, and those trees need that land. So no, the answer is no on this logging. I says, by the way, how did you find that she has land with some few trees on? I says, this is eastern Washington where it's dry and these are going to be pines. Uh, you know, you guys must be scraping the bottom of the barrel to look for this kind of thing. He says, well, you know, uh, there's been so much clear cutting, you know, that trees are hard to find. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> he says, we found it by satellite. Ah, he says, we, global point. positioning system, satellite. Uh, he says, our company scans, uh, has satellite services or uh, contracts to have mm -hmm. them. And we scan the area from satellite, and then when we get an area, we can use global positioning to get the exact coordinates, and then we go to courthouses and look up, and look up who owns it, is. and then we give you a call. Mm -hmm. And so um, I said, <coughs> I want, I says, that's very interesting. I mean, spy in the sky kind of thing. <laughs> um, that'll lead me to another thing, but I don't want to go off on a tangent. So I says, Mr. Livermore, you're involved in logging. Have you ever worked with explosives? He says, yes, quite a bit. He says, I want to ask you straight out, what do you think about the government's fertilizer truck story in the Oklahoma City bombing? He says, that story is a crock. A crock, yeah. This says, is public you access. You can okay. say that. <laughs> I can't say that. I won't say that. That story is all full of holes. <laughs> uh, let me put it that way then, if we can't say what he said. He says, do you want to know why? I says, yeah, I want to know why. He says, OK. He says, if you've got a stump to blow out, and he says, I've blown out stumps, I've blown out boulders. If you put dynamite, and he says, now dynamite, remember, dynamite is a more powerful explosive than ammonium nitrate fertilizer, much more. If you put dynamite on a stump, under a stump, or drill the stump, put dynamite in the stump, you can do what you want with it. You can lift it, split it, atomize it. You can do what you want. But no amount of dynamite placed away from that stump yeah. So that the blast has to go through the air to get to that stump will do any more than scar that bark. Wow. He says, you know, a, a fertilizer truck bomb parked outside is going to break glass, rattle things, mm -hmm. make noise. It's not going to get through those walls. And even if it got through the walls, it would not have the power to go on through and, and shear the columns. Yeah. 
And so I says, well, there's a formula on this, because I had heard General Parton, I had heard General Benton yeah, Parton we, speak. That was part of the... That was part of it. You know, how yeah. it falls off at the inverse cube right. of the distance. You know, one over the distance cubed. That is a very small fraction if you get any distance away. Yeah. The power of the bomb falls off. So that's Leroy Livermore. The second man, and it's very recent, it was uh, this spring, I talked to a man named John Whiting from Adrian, Michigan. He's an ex-Army man, and he was mm -hmm. a CB. He said, I was a, and I think I have the numbers right, I hope. He said, I was a CB-30. He said, CBs are engineers in the Army. Mm -hmm. We do a lot with explosives. You know, we've got to level things, smooth things out, move things out of the way. He says, ammonium nitrate. He said, I've used ammonium nitrate. It is not a cutting charge. I'll tell you what I mean by cutting charge. It cannot cut steel. It does not have the brissance, is the technical term. It does not have the brissance, the actual velocity and force to shear off steel. It cannot cut the steel rebar inside the Murrah building. Therefore, it cannot shear the support columns. Probably mm -hmm. could not even go through the walls. Yeah. It's a low velocity, slow moving. If you bury it in the ground, it will move earth. He said the only way ammonium nitrate could have actually taken that building down is if you dig a big cavern underneath the building, fill it with ammonium nitrate, and shake the earth so much that you make your own earthquake. Yeah. He says, and nobody's saying that that was done. He, I said, well, how do you think it was done? Sean Whiting ex-army man says it was done by charges, explosive charges placed on the sport columns. Yeah. That's how it was done. If there was even a fertilizer truck, why, it's a decoy. Yeah. Um, the third man was um, a construction worker. He was operating a bulldozer and he was doing some work on my farm just uh, a couple weeks ago. He works for uh, Pipkin Construction. His name is Gary. Don't know his last name. I, we talked quite a bit and I never got his last mm -hmm. name. I just happened to mention it in passing and asked what he thought about it. He says, oh, uh, there had to be charges mm -hmm. placed on those columns. You, you can't blow that building up by something placed outside. You know, I was really surprised how, um, how well received um, these shows were because uh, uh, as a people, we actually can think. Yes. And it means that maybe all the chemistry degrees and all the physics degrees out there can actually be put to use if someone just flips that switch and says, turn that on. Mm -hmm. You actually have the knowledge yeah. to be able to figure these things out. Mm -hmm. Don't just blindly swallow what an authority figure or someone on major news media tells you. Yeah. Now, the, now, one of the major questions that people had in their mind, and I had lots of phone calls, um, I had lots of phone calls, was why do you think that happened? And so I'm going to try okay. to blow you back to this, back to the anti-terrorism bill uh, here. Um, and you know, it's so really okay because if we can do it all in one hour, rather than just have bits and pieces, we can do it. Uh, we, we can make it a two-part. It's not okay, a problem because it's important that the average citizen knows what it is that okay, and I'll, how it affects them. I'll go. I'll go slow. Mm -hmm on this. Uh, first, I want to thank uh, Senator Patty Murray's office, uh, Senator from the state of Washington, U.S. Senator, for sending me this. This is a copy of the Anti-Terrorist and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996, mm -hmm. which was passed and signed into law April 24th, 1996, just a few days to a year over uh, after the bombing of the Murrah Building. So it's like they're trying to get it passed for the anniversary. Mm -hmm. Just hold, hold it still there. Okay, hold it still. They're no. trying to get this go, passed. Go this way here. Go this way. Go that way. Okay. There you We're go. Over there. <laughs> they're trying to get this passed uh, on or about the anniversary. Uh, in politics, anniversaries mean a lot. And so this is the bill. It is about a 150-page bill. And actually, I don't have all of it here. There are about 12 sections at the very end of it that are missing. I discovered that as I was reading it. The 12 sections at the end are rather technical, and they deal with plastic explosives for the most part. And they're not... Uh, so not, they're missing, huh? They're missing. Mm. Not, not critical. It'll be interesting to see those, actually. But yeah. most of it is here. And something that's also here that's very important, I found very useful, is a commentary by Charles... And I'll get his name exactly here, because I'll just turn to it. There's a commentary... So that I... came directly from from uh, her office? Yes, it did, mm -hmm. from Washington, D.C. Would you happen to know if that's available on the Internet? Yes, it is. It is. And yes. I can give you the website. Okay. Uh, I'll, I'll read the website. 
Uh, and I'm not good at reading websites, but I'm going well, to read I it. Well, I am. I'll do so. I'll read it. Okay. Here's the website. Go ahead and read that website so people can get it. Because that's what I think her staff did, is just get it off the web. Congressional record. It's part of the congressional record. Okay. I'll read it. www.fas.org site slash IRP site slash C O N G R E S S slash 1996. Um, so it, I would assume that stands for um, organization uh, and then the, the Congress records of 1996. And that's where you would find that. And it's on, uh, on the web page. And uh, if you didn't get that, call me and I will be willing to make that available to you. You know, with phone numbers or long numbers, I always like to hear it twice. Oh, gee. Go ahead and do it twice. Twice. Because, Here we you know, go. It's like you've got one thing that you're wondering, did I get this letter right or that number okay. right? And if you give it twice. Okay, okay. www.fas.a, excuse me, org slash site slash irp slash C O N G, like George R E S S, site slash 1996. Boy, I'm glad you read that instead of me, because I am not good at reading those websites. Okay. Well, uh, I want to thank Patty Murray's office for sending this to me, and I would also like to thank the man who wrote the summary. Um, and I believe he's somebody official. It's Charles Doyle. Charles Doyle wrote the summary, and he's a senior specialist with with uh, something called the American Law Division. I am going to assume here, although I don't know for certain, that the American Law Division is part of the State Department. Um, and because the State Department is heavily impacted by this bill, and the State Department had a lot to do with this bill. Now, I'm going to read um, one of the things he says here to lead off here. He says the, the sentence. The bombing of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building in Oklahoma City, and to a lesser extent, the bombing of the World Trade Center in New York, supplied the most obvious stimuli for this bill's enactment. This is a brief summary of the act. Um, this bill was first, uh, this act has several sources. The first of the major comprehensive terrorism bills in the 104th Congress, and this was passed by the 104th Congress, the public law reference to this bill is public law 104-132. Okay, the legal reference is public law-104-132. Uh, public law 104-132. That means it was passed by the 104th Congress. And it was also known as S-735, meaning it's Senate Bill 735. Mm -hmm. uh, so this act has several sources. The first of the major comprehensive terrorism bills in the 104th Congress, had a different number then, H.R. 896 S390, was introduced on behalf of the administration, that means President Clinton, on behalf of the administration on February 10th, 1995. Hmm. Well, that's two months before the bombing. Now, I'll ask this rhetorical question, a couple of questions. Repeat later. that. I like to hear things twice, too. Uh, okay, here it is. This act has several sources. And I'm reading uh, his, his summary for the Anti-Terrorism and Death Penalty, Effective Death Just Penalty Just the date, act. yeah, the date, the date. I want to This act has again. several sources. The first of the major comprehensive terrorism bills in the 104th Congress was introduced on behalf of the administration, President Clinton, mm -hmm. on February 10th, 1995. Mm -hmm. That would be more than two months before the before. bombing. Okay, thank so you. So this is in the hopper before the bombing. Right. So I'll ask these two rhetorical questions. Um, the way he's worded it here uh, earlier, he says, the Oklahoma City bombing supplied m the most obvious stimulus for its enactment. Mm -hmm. In other words, the Oklahoma City bombing caused this to be passed. Right. I'll turn that around. Did this bill cause the Oklahoma City building to be bombed? I'll repeat that. Could it be that this bill caused the Oklahoma City building to be bombed? Because From what I understand, it was stalled at that time. You couldn't stall. Tom stalled. Yeah. It was stalled. <laughs> well, if I had anything to do with it, it would sure be stalled. It'd still be stalled. <laughs> and when I read it, I mean, it's so horrible. I can believe it would be stalled and it would go nowhere. Yeah. Nobody would vote for this. This wouldn't be passed yeah. without something like 
the Oklahoma City bombing. Yeah. There's a Latin phrase for these kind of things. It's called uh, "ko ab ordo," you know, uh, or, or or maybe I have that reversed: "ordo ab chaos," order out of chaos. Mm -hmm. If you can create chaos, you can get a certain kind of order right. out of that. And without the chaos, you can't get the order, or maybe not the order you want. Yeah. So, the um, and I think in the opening shot there was a reference to the Reichstag fire. Uh, that was the opening shot that's used for the program, mm -hmm. it's shown behind us. This is the fire that burned down the Reichstag in 1933. When Adolf Hitler was elected chancellor of Germany in very early in 1933, he was not yet a dictator. And he set out to remedy that with some help from the other Nazis. The Nazis themselves set the fire and burned down the Reichstag, the German yeah. parliament building. That building had a great deal of emotional, spiritual significance to the German people. And after they did it, they blamed it on their enemies. And yeah. then Hitler went public and said, we are under terrorist attack. I need the powers of a dictator to save the nation. Isn't that scary, though? Isn't that scary? And it wasn't until 14 years later, the Nuremberg trials, mm -hmm. that the world finally found out that the Nazis themselves burned, burned down that down. building, burned down their own building in order to get legislation passed at that time similar to what's in our own anti-terrorist act of 1996. Yeah. So I'll go into some of the particulars here. The first thing I'll say is that one of the most time-honored civil liberties is the right of habeas corpus. Mm -hmm. It's in the main body of the Constitution. Uh, it's in Article 1. I have a copy of the Constitution right here. And it, it says that Congress may not suspend or abrogate the privilege of habeas corpus except in times of actual rebellion or invasion. Invasion. Habeas corpus is so important. It was known to the founders as the Great Writ. And, and what is it? It is a way of challenging your imprisonment. If you've been imprisoned or you're slated to be executed, you can challenge that and say, my imprisonment is unlawful. Right. I want the courts to take a look at how I'm being treated. Mm -hmm. it, it, and it doesn't always mean that there was anything wrong necessarily with the conviction. It's slightly different than saying I was wrongly convicted. It's saying I'm being wrongly punished. Punished. You know, yeah. Maybe all yeah. the procedures were actually followed for that conviction. Maybe that's a conviction that's technically right, but yet if you're innocent, in mm -hmm. fact, and all the procedures were followed, and the conviction's technically right, there's still a great travesty of justice occurring here. Mm -hmm. you know? And habeas corpus is the great writ to get the courts to look at it in another way. In another way. Now, I'm going to stop you okay. here. Um, I heard you talk, yeah, and I believe you did hear, hear the same talk, where they, um, and I forgot who the speaker was, and he was talking about um, the, uh, the musical Le Miserable, where when we watch that, it is so horrendous how uh, this man stole a loaf of bread mm -hmm. and he got all his time, 19 years, I believe it was. Yes. And then the speaker went on to explain that is when he when he got the um, when he got the bread and he had to push someone to run away, yeah. and that was the difference in how this whole case was handled. And I don't know all the details, but the, the speakers of some of us did say in that, according to the laws that we have now, which are part of this bill here, um, back then, the 19 years for stealing a loaf of bread, they were, they were soft on crime. You know, I'm glad you brought up Les Miserables. Uh, Victor Hugo, uh, a great uh, libertarian writer and a powerful writer, what he did in that is he shows, uh, many, he did many things in Les Miserables, but he shows the hero as an archetype of the libertarian man yeah. who is going to follow his conscience and do justice regardless of formal laws. I mean, yeah. his, his sister, I believe it was his sister's family, was hungry and he was going to feed their children and he didn't have any other way to do it. And then I believe the inspector, I may have the name wrong, Javert, Inspector Javert. Javert. Mm -hmm. uh, is suspicious that Jean, well, Jean Verjean escapes uh, by a certain set of circumstances, and Javert devotes his life to pursuing, to pursuing Jean Verjean, and and recapturing him, and he does this because it is out of his respect and worship for the law, no matter what it is. It's the law the is law, the guiding principle. Yeah. He's not he's not concerned with what the law actually says. 
whether it's just or unjust, but just because there is a law, it must be followed, and this rigid yeah. rule is what guides men's lives and keeps us from chaos. I mean, this is his thinking. Yeah. And so at the very end, there comes a point where they have their final showdown. Yeah. And after all these years, <coughs> when Inspector Javert cannot bring himself to actually apprehend uh, Jean Verjean, he kills himself mm -hmm. because he can no longer, if he has to violate his authoritarian principles, mm -hmm. following authority and the law, just because it's the law, he, that's been his guiding light all of his life, he can't do it. His yeah. conscience finally, basically forces him to let Jean Verjean go, but then he can't live with himself. He is a man without a country, so to yeah. speak. Uh, and in some ways, you know, that leads us almost into jury nullification because that's the classic yeah. difference. Yeah, but that we've already covered, we've already that, covered so that. So we want to get back to the... Uh, it may come up in this again. Mm -hmm. I'll get back to the actual mechanics of this. Okay, what, okay, the, the great writ is habeas corpus. This practically does away or severely limits habeas corpus. Yeah. What it does, and the very first part of it, what it does is it puts a time limitation on habeas corpus. If you are a state prisoner uh, and you want to file a habeas corpus petition with the federal courts, you have one year and one year only to one do it only. from the date of your final review in state court. Yeah. For many uh, indigent, unlettered, uneducated, maybe natively intelligent prisoners, but they don't know how to do these things, they're uh, their account, they have no money left for counsel. They may have never had counsel. This yeah. is a practical impossibility. It's a impossibility. Sometimes they, yeah. some of the papers get lost. Sometimes they are still in transition from the holding places to the actual prisons or penitentiaries they get to. So that's a tricky little the piece The year of can run out there. on them. Yeah, it really, really can. Easy. And the, um, it changes habeas corp federal habeas corpus rules from you are able to file habeas corpus at any time as justice requires, and the yeah. courts have a, a right and opportunity to look at your case. Doesn't mean you're gonna be successful, and they dismiss a great many of them, but still, you have the opportunity, you can yeah. do it. This puts an absolute one-year bar. Uh, and I believe that bar is the same also, a one-year bar for federal prisoners trying to file a federal habeas. Yeah. Then, for death penalty cases, if, if instead of just imprisoning you, they're trying to kill you, yeah. six months. What? Only six months, if you're a state prisoner you got to file that habeas within six months. That, does it explain why? Well, it, it does. Uh, the commentary explains why. Uh, the, uh, Charles Doyle says that we have this, uh, this backlog of people on death row. At the time he's writing, 3,000. Yeah. He says every year about 300 more are added to death row, but yet only 50 are being executed. We have a bottleneck here. Uh, we've got to somehow open the floodgates and get more executions. Mm -hmm. He's very blunt about it in the summary. Yeah. In order to get more executions, and yeah. I don't think anyone in the public uh, would uh, disagree with this. If you get more executions and you start getting a flood of them, you're going to have innocent people executed. I mean, I think we've all seen in the papers where I believe it was the state yeah. of Illinois yeah. had to let about uh, half their people off death row because, and no thanks to the police, but thanks to independent uh, news reporters and I believe a Catholic priest and some journalism students, they discovered half of them were innocent in fact. Yeah, I, actually they, they did. Uh, it, and they not, have a moratorium. Yeah, right? not, not only did they, you know, um, change their sentences, they actually had to free them because the people didn't do anything at all. Didn't do anything at all. Uh -huh, yeah. So that, that's pretty scary to, um, for something like that to limit, uh, um, to the, the lady, what is her name, the one that was on death row? I'm trying to put oh, a face on no. what we're talking to here. Yes, and she was she here was, in this area yes, here. Yes, she was, and, oh. and um, uh, we're going to do, we, we will bring, do a show with her. She, was, her she was on death row, actually. He got, he got executed. And her husband was actually executed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were, um, oh, God, what is her name? Anyway, they had been falsely accused uh, by circumstance, and uh, her husband was executed. And then she herself spent, I believe, 17 years before they found out she was innocent. And now with the six months, we would have never been privileged to even talk to this lady. That's right. She would have been executed. I have a total blank to her name. I do, too. I, re I remember some of the circumstances. She and her husband were just hitchhiking. Right. And they got picked up by the wrong person yeah. and then later tied into a crime to because a of who crime. picked them up. Right. And um, 
And I don't think even the person that picked them up got uh, uh, got the death penalty. Mm -hmm. Actually, some of the other uh, Olympia uh, shows have covered that part of it. Um, Glenn Anderson has a show. I don't remember what the name of it is, but they have they have addressed that issue. So, so if I can't remember the name of the show, call the station, and they will they will give you the information. So you know, just habeas corpus the. Uh, restriction or turning habeas corpus into a hollow scarecrow, you know, something that exists in name only, just that alone would be enough to make this bill horrible. And I'm going to cut away to something that was done with one of the victims of the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, the way he felt he was treated and the way he felt the incident was being used. I'm going to be referring to um, I'll an hold article. This time. You'll hold that. Thank you. Yeah, An I'll article out that. of that magazine, which is the New American, the um, I believe it's a May 1996 issue of the New American, and uh, and that by the way is published, I believe, by the John Birch Society. It's kind of interesting how in these latter days here, uh, left and right, they both realize they have a lot to fear mm -hmm. from the police state. You know, le uh, John Birch Society is usually considered to be right wing. Um, Many of the labor unions, and we'll get to that in a little bit, who are also being targeted with anti-terrorism, uh, you know, enforcement and yeah. techniques are. Yeah, we're going to make this a two-parter because. I guess we yeah. are. We probably already <laughs> have yeah. gone through a half hour of time here. Yeah. I want to read this out of that, um, and I'll I'll read. There's a man named Bud Welch. Okay. Bud Welch lost his 23-year-old daughter Julie, in the Oklahoma City bombing, Ex and he explained that quote. I, like the other family members in Oklahoma City, was approached very early in my grief by people asking, would you be in favor of anti-terrorism legislation? No explanation was given as to what such legislation would look like or what it would do to our fundamental rights. Hmm. In the throes of my loss and with such an abstract concept presented about the bill, my response was like so many other family members who were brought here, I think he means Washington, D.C., last week to be used as advocates for this bill. I am sure they still do not understand. End of quote. Text of the article. After learning the contents of the terrorism bill, Mr. Welch became a vehement opponent and expressed his disgust at the manipulation he suffered at the hands of Washington insiders. Quote, it utterly galls us as a family, so devoted to my daughter, that our loss is being used as a political football for politicians eager to posture themselves as tough on crime to reap some political advantage, and to do the bidding of already powerful agencies who have demonstrated their inability to responsibly exercise the enormous powers they already possess." Mm. End quote. That's in, I guess first time I've heard this one here. Thank you for sharing that. I thought that would be powerful. Mm -hmm. And to go along with that, there was a representative at the time, I think he's still there in Congress, Phil Crane. And he noted in the congressional record that the letters and calls from his district were nine to one against this anti-terrorist yeah. legislation. But the stimulus was so great of all these people being killed, mm -hmm. murdered by this bombing. And then the grief-stricken relatives were there and the media, you know, focusing on it that, you know, what Grassroots America wanted, I think, kind of got lost. Yeah. Now, as a layperson, um, what do you think the purpose of, well, we, we sort of know what the purpose was, but um, what I, where I want to get with this eventually is how does it affect all of us? Because it does affect our everyday life. It does, and I'll, I'll go to another, and of course, habeas corpus, if you ever get to in a position where you might need habeas corpus, mm -hmm. it's going to affect you there. But how would it affect somebody, let's say, short of habeas corpus? Uh, some people in this country are aliens, meaning they're not citizens. They may be resident aliens, they have a right to be in the country, mm -hmm. but they are not citizens. Aliens are in a very particular, delicate, and dangerous situation because of this bill. I also want you to note, all the people who are watching this, that if you read your constitution, you'll note that the Bill of Rights talks about rights belonging to persons. Right. Not just citizens, persons. 
meaning human beings, have rights. And, and that would include aliens. And we have to remember that at the time the Constitution was written, uh, a great many of the founders, you know, had lived part of their lives as British subjects. They were not right, American yeah, citizens. A lot of immigrants. And yeah. there would be a lot of immigrants coming in just recently who were not citizens. And so, you know, the, the issue of protecting everybody, not just citizens, uh, was solved by using that term persons. persons. Another interesting issue is the term persons protects people regardless of age. You know, if you take mm -hmm. a strict view of the word person, it doesn't mean, you know, that a person under 18 or under 16 or right. under 10 has lost all the rights, uh, which leads you to wonder about some of our juvenile statutes and why they don't get juries and why they don't get a lot of their other rights. But I'll get back to aliens. This bill has provisions to allow the attorney general to apply to have an alien removed under a special new court called the Alien Removal Court, have them removed mm -hmm. from the country. First, this bill creates this new court, the Alien Removal Court. It creates oh, they it. didn't have one at all. They did not have oh, one before. Mm -hmm. It creates a special court <coughs> Excuse me. of judges only, mm -hmm. no juries. Mm -hmm. The judges are chosen by the Supreme Court Justice. That would be William Rehnquist mm -hmm. at this present time. He chooses five federal district court judges. And these federal district court judges are available to sit in what is now known as Alien Removal Court. And it will be located, or is now, in Washington, D.C. At the time the Attorney General files an application to remove an alien with mm -hmm. this special alien removal court, remove them from the country, the Attorney General can seize the alien physically, put them in custody, Just arrest them, right. put them in detention, put them in jail. And then the hearing or trial it comes before this federal judge in alien removal court. The rules of evidence are, uh, do not apply, so therefore, the evidentiary rules are relaxed, meaning evidence comes in that would, in a normal trial, be considered unreliable, such as hearsay evidence. Mm -hmm. But that's not the worst. Secret evidence comes into this court, meaning classified information that the government has, information that the government does not want in the newspapers, that the government does not want to reveal to the alien himself who is going to be removed or being accused of being an alien who needs to be removed. The, the term they use is alien terrorist. The alien to be removed is uh, labeled an alien terrorist by the attorney general. Mm -hmm. And you're probably wondering, well, what does that mean? I would uh, like to know, because yeah. the word terrorist appears dozens of times in this bill, and there's no definition. Oh. Oh, now, I'm sure terrorist is defined in other parts of the US code. Uh, but let me interrupt but not you in here. Bill. Let me interrupt you here. Um, as an alien. <laughs> I thought you'd be interested in this particular Thank section. Thank you. Yeah, as an alien, I was uh, from the Constitution that I learned, you know, as I um, did that. It was that you can always also, you know, you have the right to ask your accuser what, about the evidence and everything. And now you're telling me that that no longer applies? Well, there's some interesting tricks done here. Um, number one, they categorize the alien removal procedure when the attorney general labels somebody as an alien terrorist. And that doesn't mm -hmm. mean you've actually blown anything up or planned to do that. Uh, it can mean it's very nebulous. They do not de define terrorist. Yeah, they don't have to explain to they you what they're doing. They don't have to explain to you exactly mm -hmm. what their evidence is against yeah. you. They have to write a summary of it. But the actual evidence, if it's classified evidence, it is seen only by the judge alone, ex parte in camera. Those two terms, two Latin terms, mean ex parte without the parties, mm -hmm. okay, in camera means in his chambers, in the judge's office with nobody else but the judge and the government police agencies. Mm -hmm. So it's not truly ex parte. I mean, the government side is there. It's mm -hmm. just the attorney for the alien is not there. The alien is not there. Nobody on his side is there. Oh, my. And then the judge makes his determination. And what is the standard? It's always important to know in court proceedings what the standard is. This is categorized. And by the way, it's section 401 in this bill. Section 401 is the alien removal court and alien removal procedures. Section 401, and what it does is actually adds new sections to the Immigration and Naturalization Act. Mm -hmm. It adds a series of new sections to it. You know, these, the way, these bills are like kind of like a, a web of threads. Uh, Congress will pass a bill, mm -hmm. and then it has threads that goes out to other laws already existing and changes them. And so the threads right. go everywhere. It's why it's important to get this. You can right. find it all from going to the U.S. Code. Yeah, yeah. Just a minute. I want to say something. Uh, in the beginning, we talked about the peacock. Oh, yeah. It, it's, it, 
it's beautiful this way, and now we're getting to the feet of the matter. We're getting to the feet, yeah. We were yes. really getting to the feet. The title to most Americans would sound pretty good. Yeah. Uh, Anti-terrorism and, effect, well, maybe effective death penalty, I wouldn't, you yeah. know, depending on how many people out there think they might someday be in be danger executed, of that death penalty. Yeah. But anti-terrorism, well, everybody is against terrorism, right? Yeah. Um, so it is categorized as a civil proceeding, meaning the standard of proof is preponderance of the evidence. There are three standards of proof for trials. The civil standard and the lowest standard is preponderance of the evidence. That means more likely than not. Mm -hmm. If you had a scales here and you put the evidence on the scales, if one side just tips ever so slightly down or up, that's preponderance. Just a little more, 51%. If he is only 51% convinced that the alien is an alien terrorist, yeah. then he is to uh, approve the application and order the alien to continue in detention until he can be deported yeah, to whatever country will take him. Will take him, right. And, and you know, there's, there's people that have been incarcerated for 20 years because either nobody will take him or they didn't. Exactly. And this and, is the same way. And that's the same way. It, but it did the Supreme Court not just overturn that and said, you now turn these people loose? Well, you know, there, it depends on what statute they were looking at. There is a maze, as Claire Wolf points out in her excellent article, which is where I got the citation for this, mm -hmm. landmine legislation. It. You want to hold that I'll up? I'll hold it. Claire Wolf, uh, Claire Wolf, an iconoclast author who is not afraid to go up against the establishment. This was uh, printed in the uh, summer supplement to a book catalog, Loom Panics Books. Loom Panics is in Port Townsend, right here in mm -hmm. the state of Washington. And in 1997, they have these supplements that they publish a couple times a year to give you a sampling of their books, and they put essays in them. Mm -hmm. So it just whets your appetite to look at their book uh, catalog because you're going to get an essay. And her essay shows all the, uh, it's about 10 or 12 pieces of legislation Oops, that have hidden me. things in them that uh, are very bad, mm -hmm. that most people would be shocked or horrified at. And some of these laws are very long, and even the legislators that pass the laws may not know what's actually in it. So she says, if one provision of one bad bill is struck down by the Supreme Court, guess what? There's all these others. All the others. Okay. So depending on what precise bill they struck down, uh, you may s still have the possibility of lifetime incarceration for an alien who has been deemed to be an alien terrorist by just preponderance of the evidence and never got to see the evidence against them anyway, they might yeah. be in prison for life. The, now, the attorney general has the duty to every six months inquire if a country will take this alien terrorist. I, I'm sure it's, it's like writing a letter and saying, well, we have this alien terrorist. How would you like to have an alien terrorist? Well. You know, and the country's going to say, well, no, we've got enough alien terrorists of our own. You know. Okay. Um. The average citizen, okay, so now we've, we've talked about, you know, that this be of, be, be, could be of consequences to people that immigrated mm -hmm. and so on and so on. But how does this affect the man next door? Okay, here's, uh, and bear with me because it'll be, a, uh, there's a series of steps to this. Uh -huh. The man next door, and you or I, could be accused criminally. I just talked about alien removal. That's the civil part of this, right. a civil part. There's, a, there's some criminal parts. First, the Secretary of State, I'll move to a different government bureaucrat, the Secretary of State is given the power under this bill to designate a foreign organization or group as a foreign terrorist organization. Now, once he does that, Congress can overturn that if uh, they pass a bill to overturn that. They may not even know that he's done it. He just designates a country. Uh, or not a country necessarily, but it, it could be, or uh, an organization, and like you know, Islamic Jihad or Hezbollah or uh, someone else, the Friends of Islam, uh, is Zama bin Laden or something. It designates them to be a foreign terrorist group, publishes his designation in the congressional record, uh, or I'm sorry, in the Federal Register, in the Federal Register, and after 30 days, it becomes effective. Mm -hmm. That organization is then a foreign terrorist organization for purposes of this law. Just without a trial, without hearings by Congress, without anything. That's what I was going to ask you now. Do, the, do these organizations or people have a chance to respond to that? Yes, they do. After it's published in the Federal Register, they've got 30 days to challenge that. Mm -hmm. And if they don't challenge it within 30 days, they're barred. 
So they cannot raise the issue. So they cannot say that it's an improper designation or challenge the designation. So if their email don't work, they not they're done make for. It in time. Or if they don't hear about it. Yeah. I mean, you know, the Federal Register is huge, and yeah. things are published in there all the time. And uh, which one of us reads that every day? I mean, you yeah. wouldn't be able to do anything, eat, sleep, brush your teeth, or anything if you just did nothing but read the Federal Register. Mm -hmm. I have to take you back to where we were. Um, everyday citizens. Okay. okay. So now you, uh, they go ahead and they. They determine a person to come in that category. They have 30 days to respond. And then if, you know, if for some reason they missed the deadline, it's now established, and then the, the, they can proceed um, well, here's where it affects, against them. Okay, here's where it affects <laughs> the average citizen. Yep, so please. let's say a group overseas has been designated to be a foreign terrorist group. You know, let's mm -hmm. say uh, Palestinian Quakers or something. But I want to go to the, my next door neighbor. Okay, your next door neighbor. If your next door neighbor materially aids mm -hmm. that foreign terrorist organization, and materially aiding is defined in this as very broad, mm -hmm. sending money, mm -hmm. sending material, sending medical supplies, mm -hmm. sending literature except religious literature, uh, that is materially aiding. Materially aid for an American citizen or anyone subject to American jurisdiction could be an alien mm -hmm. living here. Materially aids a foreign terrorist organization, that is a 10-year felony. Mm -hmm. And the American citizen who sent money to, say, Palestinian Quakers, uh, you know, Palestinian Quakers against Israel or something, if they send money to that group, they can be accused of a federal crime, a 10-year felony, and put in prison, if they're convicted, for 10 years and or fined $250,000 and or both. And the citizen cannot raise the impropriety of the designation of that organization. They can't say, hold it, this is an innocent organization. This organization just hands out, you know, bandages uh, to the wounded and food to the hungry and medicine to the sick. That's all this organization does. They're barred. They mm -hmm. cannot say that at their trial. Mm -hmm. The only issue that the jury, and it would be a jury because it's criminal, the only issue the jury can, can deal with is, is this group listed? The group that the American citizen helped, materially aided, is this group listed as a foreign terrorist organization? Mm -hmm. And did the American citizen send money, food, bandages, literature? Mm -hmm. Slam dunk, convicted, on your way to prison. The guy next door who thinks he's helping the world by sending money or, or aid to some other group outside of our country uh, can be a felon and not know it. Okay, now, um, we're not going to be able to cover all this because we have a very little time left. Um, now, in, in your, it, it's, to me, it's mind-boggling how it got from here to here and how all these little feet could have been added to this beautiful peacock here. Um, on a 1 to 10, how many people do you think are aware of what it really says? I would say that with the general public, almost zero mm -hmm. would be aware. You know, maybe not one in a million. There may be a few more after this TV program. After the TV. And, you know, for people that want to see it on their own, read it for themselves. I'm glad you gave them the website, and they can call you and get that again if they want. Or they can do like I did. They can call their senator. Uh, I also called my representative. I called Patty Murray's office, and I called Representative Doc Hastings, my congressman from the 4th District. Mm -hmm. And um, Senator Patty Murray came through. Representative Doc Hastings did not. Oh, okay. We need to give kudos when they do right, and we need to give them their lumps when they do wrong. Yeah. Uh, my senator came through, and my Congress critter did not. But it is Public Law 104-132. It will also be in law libraries. It's on the Internet. And your congressman and your senator, this is part of their job. You know, they should be sending you what you want. And then, of course, the next thing, maybe why, they're, uh, maybe why he was afraid to send it to me is my next question to him would be, well, did you vote for this <laughs> awful thing? <laughs> We're not you know. going to go there at all. Not I, can, uh, now, I don't know if Patty Murray voted for it or not. But we're not I don't know if she was Tom, in at that time. Yeah, I could find yeah, out. But that's OK. We yeah. don't have to go there at all. I, if she was in Congress, see, she, they passed it in the Senate by, a, I think, about 98 to 2. Mm -hmm. So it passed overwhelmingly, even though it would have never passed before the Oklahoma City bombing. Mm -hmm. You know, it, from dead on arrival to slam dunk, and the Oklahoma City bombing changes it from black to white, it, from dead to very much alive and dangerous. Yeah, it sure did. So, um, but all in all, it, it's really sort of complicated, and I, I think I want to encourage the, the viewers to make up your own mind. Look at this, and uh, 
and keep in mind uh, the horrible cost of life something like that can cost sometimes and uh, it, it seems like a waste because history sort of repeats itself sad to and say it's very sad to say so as a human species have we learned anything I don't know I mean there's the famous legend and there may be some truth behind it of Emperor Nero mm -hmm. a Roman Emperor we got like two minutes. Uh, Nero sets Rome on fire and blames the Christians. Mm -hmm. I think everybody's heard that. Yeah. Uh, two minutes. I'll uh, end with this. In the commentary, in the summary, uh, Charles Doyle mentions that, uh, and there's also an international terrorist section in here, and I won't go into that. But he says one of the first acts of international terrorism well known in history was probably the Boston Tea Party. Yeah. Think about that for a moment. This bill would criminalize big time the Boston Tea Party way more than King George ever did and that was carried out by the Sons of Liberty our founders and if anyone had materially aided those Sons of Liberty like a housewife giving them a feather because they dressed up like Indians or giving them some makeup so they could paint their faces why that housewife would be guilty of being a 10-year felon under this act for and I hear music. The I'm hearing music. We need to go. Um, it's been a fun show. Come see us again. We're going to kick some more things from Tom Stahl next week. Come see us then. Thank you. Boy, did we get excited, huh? Thank just, you for having me. Hey, just got excited. Boy, that hour. Yeah, yeah.